This is a Blaring Out with Eric Blair show, and today I'm pleased to have John Fratelli of the Fratellis on the show. How you doing, John? I'm good, thank you. A tour for you. Tonight will be six nights in, uh-huh. and it all blends into one show. Uh-huh. Uh, I remember bad shows rather than good ones, uh, and I don't think we've had really any bad ones, because I can't remember. That's a good sign. When you're living the dream, sometimes you don't remember it when you wake up. Exactly. We have uh, we lead a charmed life. What was your youth like growing up in Glasgow, Scotland? Very uneventful. I kept myself to myself and nothing much has changed. Very ordinary. I didn't get into trouble that often. Teachers didn't like me because I didn't like them, it turns out. But I'm ordinary. Very ordinary. Do you think that there was unnecessary authority being pushed on you? It wasn't unnecessary, that's just their job. Both my mum and dad are teachers. But I was just in the wrong place. I'm sure lots of kids feel like that. But I have I have respect for teachers. I wouldn't want to teach, you know, a thousand teenagers, adolescent, going through adolescent angst. That looks hellish to me. What was your motivation in pursuing a career in music? Y- you fall into these things. Um, I only ever, ever found one thing in life, and I still have never found anything else that en- engages me or entertains me in, in the way that music does. Um, I've never found anything else to do with my time. So that's quite fortunate. Um, but it wasn't like a, an aggressive pursuit of having a career in music. You always thought that looks like that might be quite good fun. But it's just nice to be to be paid for something that you would do for free. What is the personal significance of the name, the Fratellis? Is it after the criminal family in the 1985 film, The Goonies? It is. Um, Barry, our bass player, chose that. Um, I still haven't seen that movie. Um, (laughs) But we had all been in bands, uh, other bands up until that point, and it seemed like we all had the same story, that the band that you were in seemed to change its name every two or three weeks. So when he suggested that name I thought you know I've heard worse and and I can live with it but that is where it came from just like the Ramones they all changed their last names to the Ramones but our reason for doing so was that when we met we were strangers to each other Mm -hmm. so we got into a room together we knew each other's first names and just like you know if you have a a plumber that comes to your house you then have him in your in, in your phone as Michael Plumber we put each other in as Barry Fratelli and it was only months later that we realized we'd all done that. So it, it was quite organic. We didn't do that on purpose. How did the success of your debut album, Costello Music, change you as a person? It made me a monster <laughs> uh, for, for a few years. How would you uh, define uh, that? Um, personally, I wasn't ready for, for everything that, that came with it. Uh, I, I led quite a solitary life all of a sudden to go from that to the opposite of solitary was kind of odd um, I've gotten better at it now I think um, but I'm glad it happened How did the Fratellis gain an opening slot for the North American leg of the police reunion tour in 2007? That's a good question and I have no idea uh, Most things tend to uh, land on your lap or, or, or it seems that way except it's probably Ten people behind the scenes making that happen, um, and it's not the kind of thing you say no to. Mm. You know, um, it, it, it. We did three or four shows. Again, my memory's not the greatest, so I think I just remember it as being quite surreal. We'd never played stadiums before, obviously. That was a, that, that took a little bit of getting used to. Did you have a chance to meet the guys in, in the police? We did, and they were as nice as 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 you would want them to be. I think in the UK press especially, Sting, he kind of gets a hard time, and he was lovely. If anybody has heard that about him, he, uh, he was the opposite. Do you remember the first thing he said to you? He offered me tea, and then realized he didn't have any tea, but he had lots of herbal concoctions, um, and then apologized that he had no alcohol, because he assumed that being from Glasgow, we would want alcohol, which at the time was true. Mm-hmm. We were kind of disappointed, um, <laughs> but he, he couldn't have been nicer. Did he have any encouraging words for you? 
He, he liked us at the time because we were a three-piece band, just like the police were. And I think he liked, in lots of ways, especially at that time, we were, there was some similarities between the way, the way we played and the way early police played. If you watch early police gigs, they were kind of chaotic. Um, and Mince, our drummer, uh, was always a huge fan of Stuart Copeland anyway. So he was... He had a great time. And how important was it for you to win the Brit Award for British Breakthrough Act of 2007? Do you know, it's the kind of thing that's important to quite a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Your record label likes it. Your management likes it. I can only speak for myself. I can't uh, measure things by being given an award because, you know, you could make an album that you really dislike and that other people like. And then if you get an award for it, you know, there's just no, there's no joy in that. I would much rather make an album that I like or make music that I like and not be awarded for it. You know, that's that's more pleasing. Was Platinum Success something you strongly desired and did it validate you as a person and an artist? It can validate you if you let it, but that's a slippery slope. Um, that's that's a hell. Mm -hmm. that, that's a hell that you, you, you shouldn't, you know, that you shouldn't go down. That's why, you know, the, the awards all get given away to people. The discs are hanging in various family members' walls rather than mine. I have nothing against them. You know, it's just, it's not, it doesn't, doesn't do much for me. So after playing Coachella in 2007, at the height of your success, why did you jump ship and how did you come to terms with touring, etc. after that? There's two reasons. I left Coachella because it was too damn warm and we had been away from home for a, a year from at that point and I was just uh, bored you know I know you're not supposed to be and I know this is supposed to be this great gift that you that you you, you don't squander but I was bored and j really just wanted to go home and so I went home um, afterwards you get it out of your system and you realize that Actually, this is an easy life. So I haven't jumped ship since. That was 2007, did you say? 11 years and counting. And I don't plan to jump ship anytime soon. Why was it important for the Fratellis to disband in 2009? Well, we weren't really talking. We didn't seem to have much of a relationship for, for, for reasons that I really can't remember. Um, and it, it just had to be that way. And similarly, when we started to play together again, it had to be that way as well. Um, we don't do anything, you know, nothing is, is thought out that well. Everything is, is reactionary. So that, you know, there was the reaction to stop and there was the reaction to start again. But I'm, I'm really glad we started again because we have so much more fun doing what we do now than, than before. And, and we make better music now than we did. It's, it's so much more fun. What was compelling you to team up with singer-songwriter Lou Hickey to form the band Codeine Velvet Club, and did it live up to your expectations? Again, the reason for doing it is that there really was no reason. Um, just for the fun of it, um, I think I had a bunch of songs that I knew wouldn't suit the Fratellis and just wanted to do something something else. Um, did it live up to expectations? If my, if my expectation was to go out and have some fun, then yeah, it did. Why did you decide to exit and do a solo album? I have no idea now. I cannot remember. I, I, was, I was kind of intoxicated a lot at that time. Mm. So I have, I have no idea. If I say just because, it's not a very um, satisfying answer, but that's the truth. But again, really, the, the honest answer is these things are just reactionary. You do it, and then, you know, you. if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, but you also, you do the thing at each time that seems the most compelling thing to do. I'm not big on why. I'm not big on looking for answers. Just because, that, that's enough for me. And when did anything ever go how you planned? I, I would wager never. What were the highlights of your time as a solo artist, starting with Psycho Jukebox? You know, really just making that record. Um, I haven't listened to it since then. I, I like making records. I like being in the studio. I like uh, taking something, uh, you know, from here to here. 
Uh, that for me isn't enough. What came after that? Again, I have no idea. Um, that was an even more in intoxicated period. What inspired the lyrics of the song Santo Domingo? Some songs are quite lucid, mm -hmm. lyrically. Mm -hmm. Other songs are, are as far from lucid as you can get. That song, as far as I remember, is as far from lucid as you can get. It's a jumble, a complete jumble. I, but I like jumbles sometimes. Your second solo album, Bright Night Flowers. Um, I actually re-recorded it uh, last summer, as soon as we'd finished making our latest record. Uh, and it's finished, it's being mixed. Um, so if somebody wants to release it, it's there. Um, why didn't I release it first time? I wasn't happy with it. How did you meet your wife, Heather, whose burlesque name is Chelsea? That's a really good question as well, uh, to which I'm not sure. Um, a chance encounter. Club, bus, bar? Um, it was a bar. And um, like all men do, you kind of assume that you, you don't have a chance. So you, you, you're almost kind of aloof because you think there's no point in trying here. Um, but I can't remember which bar or under which circumstance either and I can't remember if she was a burlesque dancer at the time either and that might have came just after but you love her of course how do you process the fact that your song Chelsea Dagger has become a sports anthem I don't try I have no explanation as to why it just seems to be and it seems to continue, uh, it's, it's funny, it's kind of a comedy, you know, uh, but it, it, I'm, I'm absolutely fine with it. It's kind of helpful in some ways, it, may, it might be unhelpful in other ways maybe. Other people might see it that way, but um, you, you have no control over that. That's It's out there and, and it's happening, and you don't argue with it. You know. So what inspired the lyrics to the song Me and the Devil off the Fratelli's album Eyes Wide, Tongue Tied? The entire lyric, I couldn't tell you, but there was a, a, a book I had read probably twice by that point by a guy called Nick Tosh's, um, which was called Me and the Devil. I didn't realize until afterwards that it was also, there was also an old Robert Johnson song called Me and the Devil Blues, um, which is strange because I used to listen to that stuff. Um, but really it just came from the, the title, um, so it was more about the title than the, the rest of the lyric because I don't remember writing the, less, the rest of the lyric. There's no lesson to be learned in the lyrics of that song? There is if somebody wants to find one, I can't find one. What inspired the album cover art and title of your new album, In Your Own Sweet Time? All of our artwork, as well as all of our videos, somebody else does. Um, I'm really not visual, I, don't, I have real, no real visual sense, so we really just hand it over to somebody who does and, says, mm -hmm. and say, you know, just give us some ideas. The, the music on this record seemed quite colourful to me, and it seemed like the artwork should, should reflect that, kind of multicoloured. Um, but again, we, we, we need somebody to, to, somebody who does that kind of thing, because we really don't. And did you approve it? We do. Yeah, we, we do. Um, but I seem to remember with this, this artwork, the f what we went with was the first idea we were given, rather than usually we get given three or four different concepts. This was the first one, and this was the one we said, definitely this. You could be giving a message that you don't want to give to people. But that would be funny. You know, you cannot, you cannot be responsible for people's interpretation. There's an infinite number of interpretations, and I would never be held responsible, even interpretations of lyrics. I would never be held responsible for how people interpret them. How do you interpret the album cover yourself? I don't. Um, again, it comes from the lack of visual sense. I, I, if there's stuff going on in it, I'll miss most of it. I'll see it as this big blob of color. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all I'll see from it. I, I'm not sure what else is going on in there. 
But I, I think it would be hilarious if there was hidden meanings. So you, there's nothing you want to communicate to fans through the album cover? No, and not even through necessarily through the music. To place demands on people, you should take this from it. it makes absolutely no sense. They should take whatever they want from it. Um, I, I would rather they just dance to it. How would you define the word freedom in the light of your depression? Um, freedom uh, uh, isn't optional, uh, and depression is. Freedom is uh, always uh, there to be had, and depression you can take or leave. Well, I don't no. deal with it. You that, that's with that's it? the point. Okay. It doesn't need to be dealt with. Don't deal with it. Leave it alone. You don't. You, you, it takes no effort. Our, our culture tells you you have to make effort and you have to deal and that with these things and chase them away and stop chasing them away. Leave them be. They're not a mistake. Uh, and then they can come and go as they please. You can be in the the worst depression ever and be completely free at the same time. It's free to come and go as it pleases. What inspired the lyrics to the song, I've Been Blind? I've only seen half of the video. I saw enough of the video to say, yeah, to, to say, okay, that's okay, you can release it. I don't think lyrically there's a whole lot going on in that. You know, you, you, can, you can take what you want from it. You know, it, and I guess in lots of ways it's quite literal. I've been blind. It's boy girl. Boy asking girl to remove his blindness. Yeah. Which she can never do. Laughing gas. Do you know, that's the only song that I, that, that I could give some, some sort of explanation for. Uh, it really is a, a plea from me to myself and to anybody else who cares to listen to stop taking life so damn seriously mm -hmm. because it's not supposed to be taken seriously that's probably the only song on the record that that from beginning to end is really trying to communicate something indestructible unfortunately that one has you know that that's the biggest jumble of all you it know, is to have so many uh, wildly different uh, imagery coming in and out um, just for the fun of it. Why is Tony Hoffer so crucial as a producer to the Fratelli sound? We can take what we do to a certain point. He can take it to a whole nother level. And we need somebody like that. And just on a personal level, we, we've always got on really well with him. His wife was uh, telling us last night at the show in Los Angeles we're the only band that they've ever invited to their house for dinner. So, thank you. I could never imagine working with anybody else. Well, the record companies a lot of times say, we got this guy, we want you to use him. That is what happened in, in the first instance. They put us together with him, and, and thank God they did. I like record labels. What do you love about the other Fratelli's Barry Fratelli bass? I just love him. I love both of them. The three of us couldn't be more different to each other. Maybe men aren't supposed to say that. I, I love them both. I'm so glad to have bumped into them. Feel that camaraderie when you're on the road? We do, without necessarily spending lots of time together and I guess that's kind of like families right like you don't you you can not see each other for months and you pick up where you left off and and to not see each other for months means nothing you know it shouldn't be read into um, we've been that way for years we know we 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 live in the same city and still between tours our albums don't see much of each other but it means that that doesn't mean anything what is the most unselfish thing you ever did for somebody? I, I, I have a, a phobia of um, uh, air conditioning. It doesn't seem to react well with my voice. And so I've kind of banned the air conditioning being switched on on the tour bus. And uh, it gets very hot in there on, on our bunks. And I woke up this morning thinking, this is just crazy, it's so warm. So I went to Target and bought everybody a, a clip-on fan for their bunk. Does that count? That's sweet. It, it was guilt. <laughs> Do you think fame is fleeting? And if so, what really matters at the end of the day? 
I don't think we've ever really had fame, so I, I, I can't answer that part of it. Um, what matters at the end of the day? Being happy. <laughs> Just being happy, that's all everybody wants. Even people who do terrible things are doing it to make themselves happy. What are the two greatest sacrifices you've made to keep the fraternities together? None of it feels like a sacrifice. Th this is the thing I would do. This is the thing I do at, at home, on my own all the time. You know, I guess if you had like, if you had kids, I, I, I do have a kid, but he's grown up now. You know, maybe it would be a sacrifice to be away from home from your kids and your family all the time. Uh, but I, I, that, I can't say that from any personal experience. How would you define the word love? I wouldn't. What brings you the most peace in your life right now? Everything. Learn to enjoy any circumstance you're in. Even when I'm grouchy, yeah. What or who is the greatest love of your life? If you want me to answer that question completely truthfully, then life itself because it's just joyous. I mean, look at it. You know, our culture wants you to believe that everything's horrible, and it, it, it's not. It is if you want it to be. And if you don't, then it's a comedy, complete comedy. And even, hey, you can't escape Trump on the news, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's easy to, to bash him, and it's easy to vilify him. But, you know, even he has good, good points. Um, I think the world's great. What's next for you? We're two thirds of the way through writing the next record. Uh, we'll record that uh, at the beginning of next year. Um, as soon as we finish one record, I start writing the next one. Because uh, I have nothing else to do with my time and it's the only thing that gets me out of bed in the morning. So we will just keep rolling on making music for as long as we can uh, or a, until such time as somebody tells us to stop. What I hear in your music is the Beatles, old Beatles, and T-Rex. T-Rex I don't see so much. When I was a teenager and, and, and really when music first exploded for me, I didn't have like a, 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 a weekend job or anything, like I was never interested in, in, in earning any money it seems, but my dad had a huge vinyl collection. Um, and every every Beatles record on vinyl. So that was really my first big explosion and, and you, you never escape it. And I would never want to escape it. Um, there's lots of templates you can use, but I can't think of a, a more a broad template th than them. Thank you, John, for Thank being you. on the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show. Signing off. The Blaring Out show.